Hi, everybody. Welcome to my session. It's implementing Azure AD. I think it's still called Azure AD technically because none of the documentation has changed yet to Entra ID. So that feature hasn't been transitioned to Entra ID B2C as of now. It might, it's going to come in the future, but I'm still calling it Azure AD B2C here and I'm going to call it Azure B2C or just B2C, whatever is uh, currently in my, in my head and wants to get out. Um, yeah, uh, B2C, using it for custom identity and access management. The access management part is going to be a bit shorter and just mentioned briefly um, because the custom identity part and the demos are going to take a bit of a, uh, a bit of a space there. Um, so custom identity, what does this mean? How does it differ B2C? Some people might have heard of B2B or just how does B2C differ from other types of identities, other types of account? The first thing is that uh, customer identities or B2C identities are identities that are separated from internal identities and um, B2B identities. They usually come in their own directory. They uh, have no overlap or contact points to other identities. They are separate and managed separately from internal identities with internal accesses. Second, it's usually in a self-service model, um, so the customer can uh, create their own account, they can manage their profiles, they can delete their accounts, they can change their passwords themselves, um, and uh, they can basically just, yeah, uh, you don't have to do any kind of input. You can just say, this is our portal, you can go in there. Everybody has used it in the past, I'm pretty sure. Um, Stores like Amazon or uh, even a Google account would technically be B2C identities. You have your own self-service sign-up. You can do all the management. And if you don't want the account anymore, you can um, delete it yourself. All of that is considered a B2C identity, the identity that you as a company uh, provide for, um, for end customers and not for business partners, basically. Um, and the third part that is B2C and not B2B is that it's mostly, as I just said, it is used for access to um, external platforms that you provide and not necessary or not your internal information. If you want to share a document with somebody that your HR personnel is working on, you're not using a B2C identity for that. You're getting a B2B identity or you're creating an internal account for them to, to share that with them. But B2C, would be like you're selling a product. You want to you want to uh, have an account for somebody to buy that product from you. That's where B2C comes in. We're actually jumping right into the demos after that. So hopefully nothing goes wrong here. We're going to just see how do you set up a B2C tenant. Okay, so this is in my uh, personal demo tenant. Um, I got some licenses for that. But we're talking about licenses a little bit later. Um, and uh, yeah, how do you set it up? It's uh, pretty straightforward. You just have the Azure AD B2C. Hopefully I'm selecting the right one because there are two ways, two, two menu points here. Um, yeah, and this is the uh, obviously wrong one. Uh, yeah, I wanted this one. Uh, a B2C tenant basically is just an Azure resource. It runs in a subscription. And it is spun up like any other resource. You can go to the create new resources and create a B2C tenant for you. You select the uh, the tenant name, the blah, 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 at on Microsoft.com. And then it is run in a subscription that you own. Um, so, uh, and the billing also goes over that subscription. So you don't buy any additional licenses or anything for that, um, for that tenant. Uh, so you can find it under the B2C tenants tab. It needs a resource group where it's located, and then you can access that tenant. Um, usually when you create a B2C tenant, the uh, admin user that, that created the resource is going to be the global admin of the B2C tenant that you created. So you don't have to do any additional stuff, which means since I use this, uh, this account to create um, this B2C tenant, I can go to switch directory and you can see I have this B2C tenant in here and I can just switch to that. 
and then I'm 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 going to be redirected to um, the uh, Azure portal of this B2C tenant. So you can see here in the top, I switched from my tenant to the uh, B2C tenant. The uh, organization name changed, and uh, in that tenant, all the configuration you can do, um, you can basically find in the Azure AD B2C um, section, in the Azure AD B2C blade. Um, where you can configure uh, all the stuff that you need to enable and facilitate those sign-up flows and stuff like that. The, the process, the way it works is you basically register an application with your B2C tenant instead of with your um, corporate tenant. And then when you sign into that app, when you open that application, it can be a web application, some kind of desktop application, whatever you want to do as long as the connection is uh, working to the Azure B2C tenant. Um, and then on the sign up dialog of that web page, uh, for example, I'm going to use a web page in my demo, so I'm going to refer to the web page from now on. Um, instead of uh, going to the regular Microsoft login uh, dialog, you end up with, uh, with a, what's called a technical profile. Um, it's, it's a user flow that uh, allows the user to input their own credentials, decide on their password, provide some additional information like a name or an address, and then um, create that account and use that account to sign in. Uh, as you can see right now, there should only be one account, which is this admin account um, that is using. There's no other account at the moment, uh, but we are going to get one account into the system later so that we can show that it sh shows up here as well. And the most important part is, or one important part is, this user is considered to be a member of this B2C tenant and not a guest. There are some limitations regarding guests in, in, in regular corporate tenants, Azure tenants, but um, these identities, even though they are externals to your organization, they are for this for purposes of this tenant and for condition access policy and stuff like that, they are considered members in this tenant. So uh, if that ever comes up, um, might be good to know. So um, before we set up user flows, what you can also do with these um, Azure AD B2C uh, tenants is that you can provide additional identity providers. Usually you only have the local account provider, which is just a regular email sign up, but you you often see stuff like, hey, want to sign in with your Amazon account, want to sign in with your LinkedIn account, you want to sign in with your Microsoft personal account or anything. And you can actually set that up in this tenant. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, basically, every single one of these providers you see here has a functionality where you can uh, where you can get that LinkedIn, for example, you can go, I think it's to dev.linkedin.com or something um, where you can then generate a, a short code that you need to paste in there and then it builds the connection up. Um, the Microsoft account here is probably going to be the most straightforward one. So I'm going to uh, do that right now. I'm just going to need an editor right now for, um, for all of this information here. Uh, this one. Uh, and then I need to switch back to the main directory. This is this is a bit of a, um, I'd say, weird workaround because, uh, unlike Google or unlike a Facebook or an Amazon account, you're not going to the dev page of that social identity provider, um, but instead you're going through. Um, the capabilities of your corporate directory to also facilitate social devices. So I'm right now back in my main corporate tenant and I'm going to the app registrations to create a new app registration. Uh, and um, basically you select personal Microsoft accounts only, which means this on this app, you only allow personal Microsoft accounts to authenticate. You give it a name, B2C demo, and uh, you pick a platform. Then this is the callback URL. 
and you register that. Need to save our client ID. I think it was the tenant ID as well, but we'll go back and check right now. And we also need a secret. So if anybody can remember that. Not so secret, secret. And then we're going back to the um, B2C tenant and we'll just take a look if I got the correct uh, correct information that I need. So this is the client ID. and the client secret. And now this is, as you can see here, the configuration is set up All every single identity provider that has something in this configuration column is set up for use. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Sure you can, if you want to set up LinkedIn, everything is documented really well. It's step-by-step, step. Um, switch to English. You can just go through it. It's, as you can see, it's just going to an URL, getting basically the same two strings I just get, got from from Microsoft and put it in here. Um, and that's documented for every single pro entity provider that wants to be in this list. They need to basically provide that documentation to Microsoft so they can publish it on their documentation. So um, shouldn't be a problem to get through that, to, to follow through that. Um, so now we got this entity provider uh, connected. I need to get back to my checklist here. Um, we can actually go to the user flows. There already are some user flows because I did them for uh, testing um, because every single application needs at least these three basic user flows. It's a sign in and sign out user flow. Um, it's an edit profile user flow and it's a password reset user flow. So those are the three user flows that you need. Um, and the sign in is also the sign up user flow. You can set them up separately if you want to create one. You can do a sign up and a sign in separately, but um, you can also do that as the same dialog and then it gets triggered whenever a user selects the, hey, I want to sign in or sign up button and you don't want to do them separately, then you have the this typical dialog where you say sign in or want to create a new account and, and then you select that one. Um, creating a basic user flow is pretty simple as well. Um, the nitty gritty part is something I don't have a demo of because uh, Quite frankly, it would take too much time and you'd get bored and uh, probably I get I would confuse myself. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you have um, you just select it. You can select the version um, and then you uh, have this option. Uh, there's this dialogue that you go through. You have to provide a name, uh, sign up, sign in, uh, and we want to do either email sign up or we want to also pro also allow people to actually use their Microsoft personal accounts instead. Um, and uh, you can also select which kind of multi-factor authentication do I want. You can select it right here. Um, you can go to always on, or you can go to conditional. This, you can, um, this usually triggers the condition access policies or risk uh, evaluations, all of that stuff. Um, gets uh, not passed through, but um, if you have it licensed in your corporate tenant, it's also licensed for your B2C tenants. So if you're if you're P1 licensed, you can do everything except the AI risk evaluation, which is P2, I think. And if you're also Azure AD P2 licensing, you can also use those uh, those yeah AI risk analysis um, CA policies um, to enforce MFA on uh, these types of accounts that uh, sign into your B2C applications. Um, but we're keeping it off right now because um, I don't want to go through every single MFA all the time. Um, 
and you can also say what kind of attributes you want uh, the user to have to provide. Um, you can collect these attributes and the return claim is what it says. So those are the claims it returns on the assignment. So if I select the given name, the surname here, it asks the user in the dialog to provide first name and last name. Um, and if I want them on the sign in dialog to also have the first name and last name in the token that they get back, I also have to select the return claim option here so that um, they are not only asked what the information is, but also in the token it says what is uh, in there. So um, then you just hit create and you create a new user flow. That's uh, the non customized, non corporate branded, non everything basic user flow that just enables your application to work. Um, I just so the next thing we're going to show is what this actually looks like. I need to go here and I need to change this one. And this one. Hopefully everything works because otherwise uh, we're gonna have a problem. So I should be able to navigate to that uh, to that URL. Yeah, ignore that. We're in the local host, that's fine. Don't translate. So as you can see, this is the sign up, sign in button up here. You could have a separate sign up and sign in button to through user flows and trigger them differently in the, in the code base. But for this, I'm just showing it uh, this way. So if I select the sign up, sign in button and everything works correctly, I can either sign in with my email address and my password. Um, I can do the don't have an account, sign up, or I can sign in with my Microsoft personal account. Um, if I do this with the, uh, with if I don't check this option in the user flow, so if I turn this app off and I go back to the user flow and modify it, this entire block would vanish. So there wouldn't be an empty block or anything. Um, just for completion sake, I'm going to show the sign up now option. As you can see, um, I'm going to input an email address and I need to actually check that one because I created an account. And before I can actually input anything else, I need to verify that the email works. That's just how the email workflow functions. So if I go to Gmail, and I should have really picked the shorter uh, email address here. Uh, I should have an email with a verification code. In my inbox, I can grab that one out and verify my email address. And after that, I'm capable of providing the uh, additional information that is required. As you can see here, I'm asked to uh, provide the other information that I wanted in there, and then I can select create. And now I'm actually signed in here. Uh, and as you can see on the claims, this is what the, uh, the token returns. You can see this also has the given name and the surname in there. Um, and it gives some additional information for the claims. This is usually just important for the application, not for the user themselves, but um, just to show what is actually returned when the user is signed in with that type of account. This is what happens. And if we go back to the uh, to the B2C tenant, this user now shows up here. It still has an unknown name because I'd never asked for the display name. We could actually ask display name as a separate option. But if I go in here, you can see that the um, in the properties, the first name and last name are filled out, but the display name is, I didn't ask for it. So I just put unknown there because it's something that needs to be filled. But um, we didn't ask them for that. Could be a username, could be, you know, whatever you want to have them. You can have the 
uh, it's usually just a text field if you do it like this. If we're going to the custom policies later, you can do much more with that. Um, so let's go back to my uh, the rest of my uh, demo here because we also have we go back here like this like this so um basically what you can could also do is these where did i hide right now you could do conditional access policies we could show that um, if you just want to go back to the application we can do the added profile here you can i could provide city information here you can see i can change my display name here um i don't know let's go to germany and um, if i'm going back now uh, it will have updated the user uh, or it will update the user soon and then it should say Jan Boons in here um, so you don't have to do anything you can put the entire workload on the customer to do all of that stuff for you um, I don't know if you're interested in seeing how the other flows operate I could show the password reset I could show how you set it up what other options are there we could go through one more um, identity provider if you want to see that but I think You've seen one you pretty much know the process it's uh, it's the same one for all of them uh, and the next bigger thing is in this identity experience framework uh, i don't have any demos prepared for that this is the i'm just going to show a bit what it looks like here we can go into a bit into a few of the technet documentations because this is um, designing your experience the user experience as code you uh, can provide um, HTML frameworks where you embed your sign up flows. Um, it's basically structured. We can go back to the presentation. It's basically structured like, uh, yeah, you just customize it. You can customize it more um, and you can do quite a lot of stuff with it. So we're going back to the presentation here. Um, so the custom policies are the big part where we do all of that. The first thing that you can do is that you can define the claims the same way you define the claims in um, in the uh, short uh, yeah templated um, sign up flows. You can define what kind of claims are you getting, um, what kind of claims are you outputting. Um, you also have the option to define claim transformations. For example ask the user for their first name and last name, but the display name doesn't need to be asked. You can just say, do last name, comma, first name, or do first name, last name, or whatever structure you have. You can define these types of um, transformations. You can uh, use that to, um, you can ask them for, uh, for a zip code and, and uh, query something um, to get the, uh, the city they are in so they don't have to input their city just the zip code um, and the country and then it figures everything out itself um, you can all of that is possible just with those claims um, you also uh, can and how you do this is with those so-called technical profiles technical profiles are what defines um, what the user experience not what the user experience looks like, but what kind of steps need to be done by the user. So a technical profile would be the sign up page. It just says there's a field that asks for the first name. There's a field that asks for the last name. There's a field that asks for an email address. There's a field that you need to verify that email address is a code before you can provide anything else on this page. And everything else around that can be customized with like any other web page as well. You can like if you're looking at Amazon sign up flow, it looks completely different than what Microsoft provides here. Microsoft's own Microsoft login looks very different from what I just showed you. So you can do that. You can use corporate branding. You can use your, your font types. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can put it in the corner if you want. You can move it around. Um, all of that is, it, it's just, um, it's just embedding these technical profiles into that, uh, into that HTML page. Um, you can also use these technical profiles for validating user input. Um, 
which basically works similar to what we just saw with the uh, with the email verification, but um, instead it verifies different attributes. You could, every everything you define in some kind of form um, as an output. So I'm asking for the username, and uh, I'm asking for a first name and a last name, and I also return those in the token. Uh, then I can say, hey, there's another technical profile which, whose only responsible is to check that this is actually a valid a valid value if you have um, some kind of corporate ID number and that those have a specific pattern. You could validate that the corporate ID you ask somebody to input or like a, you ask them to input a specific code um, that shows they are actually a customer of yours that validates them against that pattern or validates them against the database, which is also another thing you can do. Um, you don't have to stay in the Microsoft ecosystem. These technical profiles also have the capability of accessing uh, RESTful APIs and doing API calls to that. Uh, so they allow you to um, access any kind of uh, service that has a has an API um, behind it. Uh, if you have a have a system that generates your um, your uh, corporate IDs. Hook it in there. Have them generate an ID for that user. Um, this is more use case for for the other for the other um, place where you can use user flows. But something like that would be um, would be uh, would be possible. Like yeah, this is our customer ID database. You can hook it into a CRM system so that your salespeople are actually aware of new customers that use your portal so that they can contact them with newsletters or stuff like that, or just reach out to them for 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 uh, personal touch. Like if you wanna, if you ask them to provide a phone number that ends up in your in your sales team CRM system, suddenly they're getting cold called. Shit happens. Um, so. All of that is possible with these custom policies. Um, how these custom policies do that is through what they call, what Microsoft calls user journeys. This is the entire path from I hit the button for sign up, sign in, whatever, until I end up with my token and signed into the application. Um, that is. Uh, Quite the uh, that can be quite the journey if you have a tool if you want to put that data into a CRM system if you want to generate some kind of customer ID um, if you have manual process behind that where somebody needs to approve that you could implement that if you have a tool if you have a service that is capable of providing approvals you could hook that into a call the, the user journey will wait on a step until it gets a response. If that response takes a day because some HR person needs to select yes, that would work if you want to do that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it because people don't want to uh, wait if they use a self-service portal, but it would technically be possible to do something like that. Um, and it can jump freely between technical profiles, REST APIs, and other types of orchestration steps. So you could have a user input, Put all of that into the uh, into the uh, CRM system, get that back and validate it through uh, your um, through through somebody from your sales team, and then have that feedback into another technical profile to con to be considered as validation, so that um, you're not suddenly getting somebody trying to do some random sign up with your with your service if you don't want them to. Um, and an orchestration step, since I mentioned it here, is each single step of this journey is just called an orchestration step. Um, on an orchestration step, it waits for user input, it builds connection to third party service and waits for feedback from that service, um, or it's just a validation that it does in the background, which is also a possibility. Um, I can show you some of those, uh, if I'm going to the, if we're on the end of the presentation and we still have a bit of time, I'm going to show you some of the examples that Microsoft provides for these types of user journeys. They are they have some pretty pictures, but I didn't want to put them in here because uh, well, we have a demo section we can show stuff. So after the custom policies, one other thing that obviously needs to be considered with a B2C tenant, you're managing identities. 
even if those aren't your corporate identities or your um, business partners identities, they are still identities, they are still identity information. How do you protect them? And how do you protect yourself from them? Um, and uh, the first thing that you can do is uh, you can actually use the entire identity enter ID identity protection suite that exists that you have in your corporate tenant. And you can do the same thing with your B2C tenant. I mentioned it earlier, you can use conditional access policies that you can apply to user flows. You can use stuff like location-based um, validation. You can do, uh, you can use AI to analyze risky signings and stuff like that. If you want to do some of that stuff, all of that is possible. Um, if you have it licensed in your corporate tenant, it's also licensed for all the, um, for all the B2C tenants you set up. Uh, the second thing is you can also, since it's just basically a B2C, a B2C tenant is just another enter ID tenant, which means that you can, that it, it, it creates sign-in logs, it's, it creates audit logs, it creates some kind of risk logs, or anything that a regular enter ID tenant produces, this one also produces, and you can point that to any kind of log workspace you want. In this case, um, with Sentinel, for example, you could point it to the to a log workspace in your main subscription uh, on your main pennant and have your Sentinel, your other theme system, whatever is hooking into that, also monitor sign-ins, monitor the audit logs um, in that B2C tenant or in those B2C tenants that you have. Um, that you can monitor the customer. Uh, you can monitor the customer experience, you can set up your own alerts, your own reactions, you can um, use the automation features of Sentinel to, I don't know, if you notice an account that signs in a lot, that has a lot of risky signups, you can trigger the activation of that account. Uh, and some kind of custom policy could pick up if you try to sign in with a deactivated account to de redirect you to a different type of dialogue, for example. Um, that shows you, hey, your account has been disabled because we detected risky silence. Um, please contact this number. Or please do this type of ver verification that you actually still have access to your account and trigger an entire different user journey. Um, usually, this is like sending out an email or and providing a password reset link or something like that. Um, yeah, that is the third, uh, the second thing. And the third thing, uh, it since it's an enter ID tenant, it um, has all the same uh, yeah, it follows all the same what's called governance uh, guidelines and all those uh, um, standards that uh, are ex that that you can look up. Like if you want to see, oh, is is this even GDPR compliant? Microsoft obviously says yes, so they're also going to say yes for B two C tenant because it's just an enter ID tenant. It's it, it has all the same. Uh, documents that you might need for some kind of audit attached to it that you have with um, any kind of other enter ID tenant. Um, you also have the option um, to, in, in some regions, uh, you have the option to go local. Go local means you definitely only have data in this region. It's a bit weird because if you select the if you select the um, the resource region, like you can do for everything else, if you select European resource region, all of that stuff is definitely homed in Europe. But those go local uh, things are specific countries. So go local is currently available in France and in Japan. So if you select any kind of uh, French data center, like I don't know if they have multiple, but Germany has West and East uh, and uh, you also have some uh, some other data centers in Germany, but if you select the French data center, that doesn't mean your data resides in France. It just means your data resides in Europe. If you pay for the Go Local add-on, obviously you have to pay for it. Uh, you can ensure that your data is actually stored only in French data centers. This is currently only available for French and uh, Japan, or for France and Japan, but um, yeah. Uh, Apparently, they have some uh, they have some harder regular regulations on that. You know, with Germany, we obviously try to do the Deutschland 
cloud in the past, which didn't work out so well, but that's uh, just how it works. Um, so the, we actually come to the Q&A section and we still have a few minutes left. So before we go to the Q&A, I'm just going to jump back into uh, all of this and just take a look at some of the custom policy pictures. Um, just to see how this looks and what it's actually doing. I'm just looking to see if I find the right uh, the right documentation. Because this seems to be the wrong link. I don't know why I didn't prep that one. Um, yeah, here you can see just uh, basically how it how it runs through uh, the different steps. Um, you have this relying party policy. Uh, this relying party policy is something that you define and say, hey, if this app comes in, use this user, use this user journey. And within this user journey, you have defined different um, different uh, validation steps. So, for example, you're you're selling two different. You're you're having two different customer. You have a you have a forum for your clients where they can sign in. Um, and you have a, a web shop where you want to sell stuff and they can get, they can buy something in the web shop. They can go to the forum to get technical support from their peers. And you want to have two different types of, uh, yeah, user flows in there. You don't want to have it. You want to have a very verification when they sign into the shop because a two factor authentication when they sign into the shop, because you want to make sure they're actually who they are when it comes to their money. But you don't care if somebody else asks in their name for some help in, in, in some kind of uh, message board. So uh, you don't uh, you take a different user sign in flow where you don't require MFA, for example, um, and that you can define with those uh, relying party policies, which kind of user flow is triggered. The relying party in this case is always the, as the name says, the party, so the application. In that case, that relies on Azure as the IDP to provide you the sign-up information and this token information. So um, that is where um, that is where the uh, sign-in workflow starts, and then that application says, "Hey, I'm not signing you in myself. Go to Azure, come back to me later, and just give me the token, and everything else is handled by Azure." Um, yeah, this is one of the user journeys. Just zooming in a little bit. Uh, just an example user journey. You can see this looks a little bit different. They customized it a little bit so that you have those socials in the top. Um, and then they selected one of the social accounts. They wanted to sign in with Facebook. It reads the user profile from Facebook and asks for some additional information um, if it's not there. Uh, it saves the user profile and then it uh, triggers some kind of API call to do something with those uh, claims that it got. It provides some claims and puts those claims into the token. And then the user receives the token. And then the user is signed in and uh, can use the application. Have some. Yeah. And this is just, as you can see, what happens on a, a little bit of a different, if you want to look into the user journey from a little bit of a different perspective. So you can see MFA is a step, calling an REST API is a step, calling the social identity provider is a step. As you can see here, this is a bit different because if you sign into a social identity provider, you're basically doing a trust to the social identity provider. So if you configure Google or LinkedIn or anything, you trust Google to do that verification for you. This is in some cases very important because Customers don't always like uh, <laughs> like it if you um, trust some third party that you don't know, especially if they're like in the US or something. Um, it's a bit fishy there, but uh, you can do it. And then you don't get claims back because they sign them in and they give you a token. And you only have from that step on, unless you get another additional input, you only have the input from the social identity provider. So if uh, you sign into Google and all they give out is the first name and the email address, then after that step, 
you only have the first name and the email address as information from that user because you trusted Google to validate them and provide you with the information they think you need. If you want more information, you need to call it with another technical profile, have them input it and uh, handle it from that on. And that would be my presentation. So we're going back to this slide and any questions? <laughs>